And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to... A, a man of a man of many different a man of many different talents and the, the most recent of which being the creation of a Bronze Age Mesopotamia RPG known as Into the Bronze. The one and only Guillerme Gontijo. How you doing today, man? Hey. Thank you very much for the space and to receive me in this awesome monastery. So it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? My first one? Like, the first one in my whole life? Yes. Well, I was in fourth grade. I was like, I don't know, maybe 10 years old. I don't know if the fourth grade is the same in, in the United States as, as it is in Brazil, but I was like 10 years old. And there was a, a, a Brazilian system at the time called Defenders of Tokyo, third edition. Mm. It was a system that was surfing the, the hype of anime here in Brazil. And we played like some generic fantasy stuff uh, with it. It was the first time I, 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 I played something that I could really do anything. That was my the, the impression that uh, that I, I kept from that time. So it was really impressive for me. And we played like a campaign for one year and a half. But it was quite generic. Like uh, some ideas like you have this uh, uh, a number of kingdoms and each kingdom has uh, this special artifact or, or, or magical weapon and you have to it wasn't very close to the Zelda <laughs> plot you know mm -hmm. but, but for our first impression it, it, it was like awesome for me at the time, we used to play like a one one on one session by telephone. <laughs> I was so addicted to the tabletop RPG and the campaign that when I got home from from school, I used to to call the the game master, and we 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 were we were like prototyping the. <laughs> in 1999 so we played by by audio <laughs> uh, to, uh, until until my my parents discovered the the telephone bill then i was provided to 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 play <laughs> for some time um now i obviously i um I've been I've been taking I've been taking a outside looking in interest when it comes to the role playing scene in Brazil. Um, All right. Well, as, as best as, as best as I can, as somebody who doesn't speak Portuguese. Um, but one one of the things that I've noticed, and maybe maybe it's because of the fact that my introduction was through people like you and people like um, Rolim. Okay. Is that there's a is that there's a very there's a there's a very large um, move, movement towards more old more old school more minimalistic um, play within, yes. within Brazil as as opposed to some of the more crunchy affairs in the past would would you would you say that's fairly accurate that that's the, that seems to be the trend on how things are going over there totally. Totally. We have like a huge scene in Brazil. Actually, we have a, a whole history of uh, translating games in Brazil. So we had D&D in Portuguese. We had Vampire mm -hmm. in, in Vampire, uh, Vampire, Werewolf, 
I think we had Mage, and and we had we had a lot of uh, we had Gurps in Portuguese, we had Castle uh, Ca Falkenstein. Mm -hmm. We had we, I I think Shadowrun and Cyberpunk as well. So we had a a, a, a tradition of translating games. So RPGs are not something new in Brazil. Um, uh, English is not our second language, nor even our, our th third language. <laughs> but uh, so, so the tradition of translating games made the hobby accessible in Brazil, and 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 made people want to create their own games for real. So right now we are we are living in a very golden moment in the indie scene in Brazil. Mm -hmm. We have a lot a lot of creators like I don't know just thinking out loud I, I may maybe we have I don't know maybe 200, 300 indie creators right now creating things. And and most of them are have this minimalist vision, this minimalist approach to game design, to rules. I think probably this is the result of some uh, weak economy right now. I don't know if, if that is the, the right way to say this, but when we have like a, 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 a problem in the economy of a country, we see movements like do it yourself and and something like, okay, we have to work with what we have right now. Um, uh, arousing. Mm -hmm. So we are living this moment right now. Not that our economy is totally broken or something like this, but it, it is quite easy. I, I, I don't know. There are a lot of different formats that are available to publish your RPG right now. You can publish just in PDF, or you can make a pamphlet, a pamphlet game that is something really popular in, in our scene. Or you can make like something really crazy. I don't know, maybe a, a poster game or... Or I don't know a, a napkin, a napkin RPG. <laughs> I don't know. All I'm saying is that our scene is living a golden moment. We mm -hmm. see a lot of interesting games. We see a lot of different, different aesthetics going on. So it's not just the medieval fantasy anymore. We have like I don't know maybe African fantasy. We have like. as well mm -hmm. we have modern fantasy we have a lot of things we have like Brazilian cyberpunk flavored uh, systems so we're living a, a very cool moment a very cool moment I'm very excited actually I, I talk to Lucas Rolin mm -hmm. almost every day he and his brother Thiago Rolin and it's it, often we say to each other how excited we are to see so many great names like being given some light in Brazil. We have Matheus Guax, that is an amazing writer. We have Victor Amorim, that is an amazing writer as well. We have our Yoda, <laughs> our Yoda that is Diogo Nogueira. <laughs> <laughs> we are all his better ones, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy basically, I don't know, created the, the whole indie Brazilian RPG thing. Yeah. So we are, very, we are very proud of what we are creating right now. Yeah. Um, if, I had, if I had to posit a guess, and obviously this is my, this is my own... Um, this is, this is my own theory on the, on the matter, my own hypothesis. I can't help but wonder if the turn towards 
more minimalistic style play is a response to some of the uh, crunchier affairs because the first um, Brazilian get the first Brazilian RPG that I was made aware of um, was three D and T. So three D and T, three D and T, Strangers of Tokyo, my first, my first, my first RPG ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the and first RPG, it is three D and T. From what from what I've seen, that one was a little bit on the crunchier uh, side of things. Not to yeah. the level of say GURPS. God help you, God help anybody trying trying to figure out GURPS. <laughs> <laughs> God help us. Yeah, it is not like GURPS, but it, it is. We can say it is a minimalist game. Mm -hmm. Um, and well, art always is made in response to other art. That's ju that's just how that's just how this kind that's just how this kind of thing goes. Now, I do want to go into a bit on Into the Bronze. Now, Into the Bronze is is um is described a, is described as a Mesopotamian um, RPG, a very well bronze right. a, Bronze Age um, game. Now, one of the things right. I'm curious about is what sparked the interest in doing the Bronze Age specifically. Well, I I. Grew up in a Christian house. I'm the son of a pastor. So everybody that grew up in a Christian house just had a lot, had listened a lot of uh, biblical uh, stories of the Old Testament in the childhood, in Sunday school and all this stuff. So when I was listening to these stories at my Sunday school, maybe at the same time that I I've met RPGs for the first time. I was 10 years old, 1999. These stories uh, made a huge impression on me because they were ultra violent. <laughs> they, they, were, they were much worse than all, all, all the animes I, I, I used to, to watch. Mm -hmm. they, they had some really gruesome and grim and dark stories. Especially in the Old Testament, yeah, and I I was fascinated fascinated by it. You know, I was like, oh man, I, I I really want to play something like this in this in this brutal world. You know, in, in this I don't know the the birth of civilization world. You know, the Babel Tower, uh, the Noah's Ark, all, all those stories gave me a, a huge impression. So when I created Into the Bronze, this is a game for for the for my childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. For I, I I don't know. I would like Into the Bronze existed in 1999, so I could play the stories of of Bronze Age, dry brutality, <laughs> and serious word. Totally mysterious word and mysterious aesthetic as well. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't have this game back there. Actually, I didn't have this game until some some years ago. So the, this is from where I it it, it grew up the whole idea of making a, a Bronze Age game. Yeah, you can send to that. You can add that uh, to to my whole story with my father, in my childhood, mm -hmm. seeing movies of sword and sorcery and sword and sandals. Mm -hmm. So I just love Ray Harryhausen. <laughs> I love this man and his stop motion monsters. Uh, I love Jason and the Argonauts. I love Clash of Titans. So th this kind of movie, and even movies that are not fantasy movies, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, what is the name? Spartacus, like Spartacus. Yeah. It is an awesome movie. I love the statics, you know, Fred and Sanders, Ben Ur. I love this movie. So the whole thing is, is a, a, 
I don't know, a homage to the child Guilherme Gontijo mm -hmm. from 1999 is the game I wish I don't know, I wish it existed and back there part, a part, there's a part of me that's there's a part of me that's curious if you have given given the uh, reference to Sword and Sandal if you had ever read something like Call growing up like what? I'm sorry. Call. Call. Call like K U L L from Hubbard E. Howard. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Hubbard E. Howard is amazing. <laughs> the man. The man is amazing. It, it is not definitely my favorite of him. I, I think Solomon Kane is my favorite of him, but he's amazing. Co is amazing. Yeah. Um. The reason why the reason why I reference Cole instead of instead of Solomon Kane is it's a little bit more on point with the whole sword and sandal thing, whereas yeah, Sol, whereas well Solomon Kane is a Puritan, which doesn't yeah, totally, totally yeah totally different, which does doesn't um qu doesn't quite fit, but the now. Part of the reason I ended up finding out about Into the Bronze was the was the fact that was the association with um, Pacts and Blades, and right. what, I'm cur what I'm curious about is when it came when it came to that was that was did you were you already developing aspects of Into the Bronze before you had before you had met um, the Rolems or or um, or, or was some, was some of the mechanics um, develop, developed in earnest after you had met them? Oh, some, definitely some of the mechanics were the result of of all my long talking to Lucas Holling. Mm -hmm. Definitely, the man, the man is amazing. Uh, but I, I actually the, the the first the first time I I had the idea of into the bronze. It was not into the bronze. It was bronze hack. It was a hack for the black hack second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, one year ago, one year ago, one year and a half. I don't know. So I I wrote the the bronze hack. I play tested, and it was quite functional. It, it worked, but there was there was a thing that I didn't like it. That was the class thing. Like, I don't know. I, I I wanted a game that was brutal, like Bronze Age, and unbalanced, like Bronze Age. When you have classes, you have this moment of of balancing the players. They 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 don't want the the whole crew the 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 whole team to be the same class. They they just set things out and okay, you're gonna be the I don't know, the soldier, you're gonna be the cleric, you're gonna be the magic user, and they try to balance things. And I didn't like that. So uh, thinking about that, I've met into the odd and electric Bastionland. It came like a glove. So it fit like a glove because mm -hmm. it didn't have classes. It had like backgrounds or fail careers in the, in the case of electric Basilin. Yeah. And that was amazing for me because I, I could, I could make like this 36 background list with different uh, objects and different items for each one. And the players will had to, they had to give the flavor I wanted. I was talking to Isaac Williams, my my editor for the English edition. He's the author of Mouse Reader, another into the art hack. Mm -hmm. And we were talking, and we just arrived at the conclusion that into the art is a system that creates world building through character creation. So during character creation, you have like this hints of how is this word 
your, the characters are living in. And this is quite amazing for me because you don't have to write this whole book of lore and information about the world. No, mm -hmm. you have like this table and you create the characters and you have half the way walked already. You, you kind of know, you kind of uh, can uh, feel how this word, how is this word your character lives. And then you have a lot of tables more. You have like tables for hexes. You have tables for adventure books, and, and a lot of stuff. So it, it's it's easier to to teach someone the setting, mm -hmm. and, and 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 give the players uh, some safety to play a scenario that they never read about. That's why I just for both hack and into deep bronze, basically. Yep. Now, when it comes now, one of the things that I f that I found interesting with um with in with into the bronze, aside aside from the fact that it's you that you've got a you've got a a fair amount of random generation when it comes to character creation was the concept of words. Um, All right. Spe specifically the um di the divine in the divine intonations. And what when it came to the when it came to the creation of that I realized that is that it's going to be seen as as this game's equivalent of um spells in so in some manner. But was was this something that was iterated upon quite a bit, or was the concept of words what you wanted to focus on from the get go? Uh, I don't know if I understood your question. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm curious about is, what I'm curious about is how uh, how a concept like like the um, divine intonations was iterated upon from its initial idea to its current form. All right, all right. So since the beginning, since it was a uh, hack of the Black Hack Second Edition, uh, uh, Bronze Hack, mm -hmm. I I had this idea. I I I still have from White Hack, that is an awesome game. That also uh, uh, have this mixed thing. So you have to mix phrases and or words and just. I don't know, give the, the table the interpretation you have and how this is going to translate into a magical effect. But it, it it seemed to me since the beginning the right thing to do. Because, I don't know, Sumeria is the birth of language, of, of writing language. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of things from, Ad, from Egypt have been lost through time, but we have like a ton of things from, I don't know, Babylon, Mesopotamia, or uh, and, and the Akkadians, because they, they used to just write on stone and not on paper. They created the, the writing language. That's when we just move from prehistory to history. Because now we have, we know how to 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 record our past and our stories. We don't need this oral tradition of telling the stories every time. So, language was a very important thing in the Bronze Age Sumeria. Mm -hmm. A very important. That really seemed, I don't know, coherent to have a magical a magical magical system that used the combination of words, especially the intonation of words. That is the, the I don't know, the niche of, of the language nerds. <laughs> yeah. Now, some, go, it's interesting that you, that you bring up that, it, that this initially started as a, um, a, 
bronze as the bronze hack. Going but going right. from that to its current form and into the bronze, what what were some what would you say were some of the things that were the big takeaways that you learned that you learned from 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 transitioning between the two systems? Well, the first the first thing I already said, the classes, the it, it is a, a major change. But the thing, the thing around damage was a huge, a huge difference. So because at first you we had like this, this different weapons causing different, uh, using different dices for damage, mm -hmm. and now in into into the bronze, all weapons cause d6 of damage the difference of them is where does the six result is explode so we have like i don't know maybe a common tools they don't explode and we have like light weapons that they explode at six and i don't know like we have medium medium weapons and they explode at at five, we have heavy weapons like stone axes, battle hammers, exploding at four, and and this is the maximum it goes. So, mm -hmm. so we can have this very very cinematic moments where you win one battle with just I don't know one hit because you were lucky. At, at a damage dice, and or you can like in one hit you can your character can die because you were I don't know you had bad luck at, at the, the die roll. So that was very brutal for me. <laughs> that was very bronze age for me, and this is the major thing that that changed. I think another great thing change is. It, this is in great part because of the into the odd engine. You don't have like tests for damage for attacking. All attacks always hit. And this is very different. This is very different because it changes a lot of how how you you play a, a, a fighting scene. You you can't play anymore like uh, combat as sport you know it is always combat as war because there is no combat combat that you doesn't suffer damage you will always suffer damage so you have to think well before you you hit someone or you attack someone up close so these were the the, the major changes in it Now, now I note. Now I noticed, of course, that the going going on that whole going on that whole sword and sandal approach with, and especially how that um, treats magic. I I had note I had noticed that the um, cost of the cost, of course, for using words is um, hit points or strength points in as the yeah. as the secondary. Now, one thing I'm curious right. about is was there was there a attempt early on to have a magic point system and that just got phased out, or was um, hit points always going to be the resource? Yeah, hit points always going to be the resource and always have been. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to to give this this texture of magic is not for men to do. You know, you sh you shouldn't you shouldn't be messing with the divine words. They are not for mortals. So every time you you just mess with them, all right, you can't do it, but you pay the cost. You go right. It is not meant to you, so you suffer from it. Which I I can definitely uh, I can definitely go with. Go with that, especially given the 
um, up given the approach. Um, although one, maybe that maybe this was um, clarified in there, but did you? But did you? In, did you intend to have it that you that um, the co that the cost is ba is based on the effect, or or is it based on the amount of words that are being used? No, it is it's totally based on the fa effect. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the, the advantages of surviving <laughs> in Into the Bronze. You you can gather um, more more words every other uh, every other level. I don't know level two, one more. more. Uh, yes, every level you can do can gather more words and uh, level seven this the, the last one you can get a two more words so you can combine more words and this have no extra cost based on the the number of words the, the the price is always based on what you're trying to do and not how you're trying to do it which Take taking the, taking that into account, um, I'd like I'd like to I'd like to pick your brain on the on this, like what? Now, obviously, this is something that's going to vary from table to table. But what effects would you say would be would lean more to costing one HP, two HP, and three HP, for instance? Give me. I know that there's the bones and wind example in the book, but what would be a few examples to kind of to kind of uh, give a general idea of the of exactly. the amount of power of each um, cost. Okay. Say again, you cut out for a second. All right, uh, I've just played on one show. as a player that was um, It's all right right now. Okay, so I just played a, a, a one-shot session last Friday, and there was a player character that was a mathematician. Uh, uh, mathemash, I, I don't know how to speak, speak. Let me just take a look at him. He was a mathematician, mathematician, and for that he had access to magic words. His words were, I don't know, it was like destruction, I think. Let me see here. It was destruction and it was earth. So l let's imagine uh, one HP, one HP effect, magical effect with destruction and earth. We can see, I don't know, maybe he wants to cause, I don't know, maybe some erosion in the land so they can i don't know make a trap for i don't know maybe uh, uh, he, he wants to make a, a, a erosion right behind them so the enemy that is following them falls in this in this hole in the ground i think this would cause a uh, would cost like one hp mm -hmm. let's imagine now HP, 2 HP, this the same situation. They have been followed by a wild enemy trying to kill them. I don't know, maybe 2 HP would be something like it would be something like the land the the I don't know. Maybe the the land just uh, behind them explodes in the ground, and and I don't know. Maybe throw the enemy away by the force of the explosion. It explodes from inside the land to outside. I think that would cost two HP or three HP. I don't know. Maybe I, I would talk to the players and and say okay it, it can cost 
2 HP if the damage on the enemy doesn't explode at all. But it will cost 3 HP if you want it, it, it to explode at 6, for example. And let's imagine now a 3 HP thing. A, a 3 HP thing would be like they are running from this enemy and and I don't know, maybe the, mathemat the mathematician wants to to accelerate the 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 death of his of the enemy's flesh because we all came to dust and and, and end up like dust so he wants to i don't know make his bones became like dust it is it is a destruction and has earth as well but it is a rotation this would cost I think like <laughs> 4 HP, <laughs> not just 3, but 4 HP, because it's a very powerful interpretation. But it has this range, and it, it, is, it is not like a, a rigid uh, rule. You have to talk with the game master, and all, all the table can, can, I don't know, maybe argue that, okay, this, this is like too much, this is like too complex, or this is too powerful to be just 2 HP or 3 HP. It is a thing from table to table. Which is def definitely something. Uh, yeah, and I, real I realize it's one of those things that varies from table to table. It's one, it's, but it's one of those things where, ha where um, having a good understanding of, ra of range, um, especially, especially since... You know how it is with pl with players. You you um you give them an inch and they'll figure out and they'll figure out how they'll try and figure out how much they can get away with that inch. <laughs> All right, totally. But but this is, this is the kind of magic of tabletop RPGs, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. People people ask me all the time. Oh, you want you want it? I don't know what is the right way to play into the bronze. You know, man. The way you have fun with your friends, you know, if you want, want it to be more cinematic, okay, just 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 make the, the magic uh, cheaper. <laughs> but if you want to be more more, I don't know, green dark, make it as it is written. You know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's your interpretation. It's your game. It's your table. It's your friends. I will I will freely admit that I prop that myself personally when if when running something like into the bronze I'd probably lean a li I'd probably lean a little bit towards making it making it a um make making it a will making it a will roll um sim simply be simply because do because I don't like I um. As a as a point of principle, I don't care for the idea of of making magic automatic. All right. Like I I prefer ha I prefer having that be as much of a dice roll as any other action is. All right. And yeah, that, uh, yeah. Actually, you have a, a much greater cost. It, it, it is automatic, but kind of. Because it always have a cost in the character's life. Yeah. So it is not it, the game. It is not X Men in the Bronze Age. You know, let's just make those powers everywhere and every time. You know, definitely not. The, no. the players are very scared to use the the magic system. Um, I will admit another another possibility I thought of is. Um, every is instead instead of instead of draining hit points every time a, a spell is cast, it gi it gives a pool to the GM that they can use to boost die rolls for um, NPCs or the like. I.e. I.e. by um by casting magic, you're messing around with the rules of fate, and the rules of fate are incredibly incredibly spiteful.
But, I love fate. <laughs> um, but that that's just that's just one possi- <laughs> that's just one possibility. Um, now the other th- the the other thing that I that I feel is worth I feel is worth noting is the um he- is the um hex maker that you designed for 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 um into the bronze. Right. Um, were he- now I do think hex crawls are a very un- are a very underrated um concept when it comes to gaming. Well, were hex crawls a frequent fixture for for you, or was or was that something you had discovered more recently? I discovered more recently, definitely. It, it, I I didn't have the 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 background of playing hex crawl in the in the first years of of RPG. I, just the last years, I discovered this kind of game like West Marshes and, and, and stuff. And and it was like a, a huge discovery for me. Actually, right now, today, uh, I'll play a hex crawl game. <laughs> and, and it is a very different kind of game, you know. Mm-hmm. It is not like it has, it, it has its own, I don't know, nature maybe, because you, you, you do roles that you usually don't grow and you you explore things it has this whole exploration stuff i don't know i maybe this is will sound weird but i think hex crawl is closer to studio ghibli like ghibli studio movies animations than any other um, style of game because you have this sublime exploration of scenario you know you you are cu- you, you are curious about uh, what has in this hex that has this i don't know this different uh, school or or has this different creature or this different vegetation so it, it's a lot of it's maybe a cartographer's game. <laughs> it's a game of people that just want to discover the world, and I think this is very beautiful. And when it comes when now when it comes to the vi- when it comes to the visual design of your of your own, of the book as well as some, as well as some of the other material that you've do- that you've done. Um, One thing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, one thing I'm cu- one thing I'm curious about is the is the inspiration for the type of um visual design that you've used for Into the Bronze as well as some of the um other games that you've done graphic design work for. All right. Well, uh, I'm terrible at drawing. <laughs> I'm I'm terrible at illustration, you know. I'm that's funny because I I think myself of a fraud. Uh, I, I, I don't know, kind of a imposter in graphic design because I just don't know how to draw at all. <laughs> I have no no skill drawing. Really don't have, and I actually think it's kind of annoying to draw. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of boring for me actually so um, my first my first uh, graduation was not uh, graphic design it was law so I have two graduations uh, so I just study how public domain laws worked because mm-hmm. I need that you know I have I, I, I definitely have no money to <laughs> pay some uh, huge uh, picture bank, you know, like Shutterstock or, or this kind of thing. Uh, in, in great part because um, RPGs are not my day job. They are like some kind of hobby for me. Even writing them. Uh, so I just study about public domain pictures and public domain law 
and I try to start uh, curating them and seeing where this would uh, lead me. So because of that, uh, into the brand's layout and uh, interior art are very different from what we used to, to see around there. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of public domain art in the book, but I try to use them um, in a creative way. They are always um, changed somehow, maybe in the colors, maybe in combination with some, I don't know, geometrical form. And you see this in a lot of different works I did in the past. Backs and Blades is, I used to say that my work is the middle way between, I don't know, a uh, 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 laundry machine manual and uh, exposition catalog, you know? It has the functionality, but it has this beautiful art and this, this, this avant-garde feeling of it. So you see uh, Packs and Blades. Packs and Blades, a, a lot of people <laughs> comment that to me and say that to me. Say, man, uh, e e even if I didn't like the, the system, I, I, I think I would still buy it because it, it is too beautiful. <laughs> the game has just too, like, I don't know. It is too beautiful. It has a lot of, of, of like, museum art on it and it is really museum art it is a really like paintings from the past that we just imagined and when they are combined with the text of lucas Rolin, we we can see more cock there we can see so, like this this sort of sorcery strange word there looking at us so you you can see it, I'm just opening my website right now. I have like one section of the website just with RPG games I did in the past. Mm -hmm. So we, I did right now uh, a, a game by Nerdhog and Giorgio called, I think it was Crab Tastrophe. That is like catastrophe, but with crabs, and it is like it is basically a, a B movie game, mm -hmm. like crabs versus uh, old ones, you know, crabs versus uh, in mouth creatures, and the game has just one page, and I I I, I had to 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 think how how I'm gonna to how I'm going to make this game a beautiful thing, uh, a very fun functional thing, and and show, show a little cosmic horror elements and crabs at the same time. And it was quite a challenge, but in, in the end, things worked out really well, because mm -hmm. uh, he, he, the other Jojito, said to me that he loved that the game is something in the middle. I don't know. Maybe it was the the the, the mix of a seaside uh, seafood menu <laughs> with an other book, and I love that. <laughs> I love that comment. You know, this is this is the thing. You know, we we don't need. I don't know. Sometimes I th I think that um, we are just locked in how how uh, this is not a critic it's just a comment but we are locked in how D, &D do the stuff you know well how how D, &D do the covers how D, &D do the illustration how D, &D do the mechanics how how long i don't know how many pages uh we want in our book and I like to 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 use public domain stuff because it makes me think like out of this this space this D and D spectrum. You know, I have like a, a, a pamphlet 
bestiary called bostiary that is just with creatures of uh, Hieronymus Bosch, the painter from from Holland. Mm -hmm. And and this is something quite crazy, but we have a lot of material. And I think public domain stuff makes the 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 whole indie writer thing more accessible because we we can just try. You know, I, I don't need to have this huge investment at first. I can try. And the problem in my case is that I love that. <laughs> I just I, I tried first and I I I love the, I love, I love the challenge, you know, because when you just, uh, this is, uh, some games, they just need commission art, you know, they just need it. You can find that, I don't know, I don't know, maybe a, a game of, of uh, I don't know, maybe a game of babies, babies uh, driving uh, locust maccas in, in, I don't know in in the medieval uh, India. I don't know this kind of this kind of crazy idea. They just it just needs commission art, but the idea is that just doesn't need it. Actually, you can you can have it, and I totally agree that it is awesome to have commission art uh, to the products. But I like the challenge, you know. Like I I I I, I, I love the limitations. Sometimes people think that we need like incredible computers. Uh, we have we need a, a, a huge amount of knowledge about layout design. We need too much money, a Kickstarter successful campaign to create our games. And I love the idea that we don't need that. Oh. That our limitations are actually our way to create different games. And create games. I remember someone say, someone once saying that the big secret of the industry is that we're making all this up as we go, which is a little is a little bit hyperbolic, but it's not completely totally. um, off base. Totally. Like a, I'd say I'd say a lot I'd say a lot of people who who are, cre totally. are creating um def definitely don't have it. They have some idea of what they're doing, but it's not, it's not like the, it's not like they've overthought it. It's just a case of somebody going, "Wouldn't it be cool if we if we did blank and then not stopping there?" Man, we are at the end. We are all lovers in this industry. You know, mm -hmm. we, we are not creating that to. No one is creating that to the next rich guy you know the next the next jeff bezos of <laughs> of rpgs you know we, we're creating that because we love rpgs and it, it's not because we love to sell rpgs it's because we love RPGs. you know we love we love people to play our rpgs we love to create things and 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 honestly if the the whole thing would would I know that marketing helps and studying layout design helps a lot. But honestly, we are not creating that to be the next most success. The Forbes cover magazine, you know, the Forbes, Forbes magazine cover, the next name of tabletop RPGs. We don't want that. <laughs> I don't want that. Lord knows I don't either. You know, all, all I want is... Yeah, all I want is to create awesome things and have such a rad time with my friends. And if someone in the other side of the world had some awesome time with their friends, man, this would make me really happy. Mm -hmm. That's why I create RPGs, you know. Yeah. And I think that's why most people create RPGs. For, for me... For now, obviously, I haven't I haven't gone full in in creation, but for me, it's just a case of there's too many ideas in my head, and if I, if I don't make if I don't make room, then I'm gonna go insane. <laughs> totally, totally, totally va valid motive, you know. It's, it, actually, it, it is a motive because sometimes things in your head they are I don't know 
they are not like the the most sellable ideas. Sometimes they are just crazy ideas. I don't know. Maybe I want Mad Max with Muppets. You know, <laughs> so some crazy idea like that. And and okay, let's just create a game for that. I don't know. Internet made things possible. The world is a is a village again. And right now we are in two different time zones talking yeah. like we were in the same one. And actually, you, uh, I'm talking from the future. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a messenger from. I'm a messenger for the future, and, and this could be a game, you know, like we 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 have this hangouts with the future, and we have privileged information from the future. This is a whole new concept. So. Internet makes things possible. I, I you, you don't you don't need anymore to find people in your city or in your neighborhoods to play a game in Bronze Age Mesopotamia. You just need internet, hmm. and everybody wants him to play. Yeah. Um, now, with with that in mind. I know. I know that there was the there was the um there was the, there was the recent release of um of of geez, why is why is the name why is the name escaping me right now a certain a certain game involving samurai frogs that um Nuba <laughs> yeah and Nuba what I'm what I'm curious about from you is um. What what do you see? What do you see yourself working on um, down the pipe? Hello, Mildred. Yeah, I'm still. I'm still I here. Didn't listen I, to you. Yeah, I'm still here. I was. I was asking what. What can what can what can what can be expected from from you as far as what as far as what's coming down the road? All right. Well, I'm. I can I can say too much because there are some contracts in just beginning right now. But I'm working in a lyric game right now, in a country lyric game right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm writing uh, South Hex. Actually, South Hex uh, should have been released at at uh, September first, but definitely I couldn't because I'm gonna be a, a father right now in, in I don't know a month. I I'll, I'll have my I'll meet my first son. Congr so, congratulations, um, my uh, th life got crazy. <laughs> oh, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. We're very happy right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, I I'm writing South Hacks. That the idea it is that this is a quarterly magazine that has around I don't know maybe two thousand. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, twelve thousand to thirteen thousand words. Mm -hmm. And it is the place to publish um, officially uh, think for Into the Bronze, like lore that we don't have in the, in the book, mm -hmm. uh, so, something like, like some deep knowledge about the gods, like um, uh, hallucinogenic peppers, tables, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing uh, an other half well. So right now I'm working in a Cthulhu Dark hack of Twin Peaks called Twin Dark. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm working in a, in a scenario for Pets and Blades of Symbolist Fiction. So it, it is a scenario where it is not like you're, it's closer to fairy tale and fables uh, than of sword and sorcery thing. Like everything has a, everything is an analogy to to the word. It's a symbolist fantasy uh, scenario. Uh, um, I'm working 
as well in a hack of cosmic blades and solids so, uh, and cosmic blades and uh, and solar spells mm -hmm. by Jogno Gear. Yeah. The hack is based on a on a on a video from Fields uh, of Mefflin, uh, a band, uh, a gothic band from the 90s. Um, so um, right now I'm working some commissions of graphic design. Uh, I really, if I can say, I, I really wish to work more on, on Brazilian games in English, because I think there's a, a whole world of Brazilian indie creators that have their games just in Portuguese. The, the solo gaming scene here is absolutely huge. It's like nowhere, nowhere else I, I ever saw. So it, it is really huge. So I, I would love to, to lay out things for, for the, the solo gaming scene. I uh, would love to, I don't know, maybe have some some different games. Uh, I love to write games, but I think at first place, I'm I'm not a, a game designer. I'm a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I I just love graphic design. Uh, like that man, you know, like graphic design is my passion. And yeah, it, yeah. it is true. I, I, I love to lay, I, I love to see a good spread, a good layout and spread, you know. I, I think books as objects and not like, I know, don't know, maybe a containers of text. They are not just function, but they are beauty as well. So when I lay out it um, into the bronze, I wished people, I don't know, maybe had this book in their, in their uh, living rooms. I don't know. Maybe they can, can receive people in the house and have the book as part of their decoration, interior decoration. So this is the whole thing that I that I think for games, you know. I think about them as not just things for our nerdy niche, but things you would give as a birthday gift to someone that doesn't play RPGs. Mm -hmm. And if it if that person doesn't play it and even don't like it, it doesn't matter because uh, they will love it. It is beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. I don't know, maybe just passing the pages and looking at all, all of those beautiful paintings. <laughs> you know, and I love this idea that RPGs are not just games, you know. They are objects. They are, they are, they are part of the of, a reality of our space, they occupy a, 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 a place in, in our houses, and I love it. Yeah, I can, de I can definitely see that. Um, well, to, to, with that in mind, I, um, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come onto the show and, um, and talk and talk with talk with talk all the way from the future. Um, don't give me any lottery numbers. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Oh, our body and Doc will come for you, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>